I'm, I'm doing is uh, I start with the low uh, lambda of some random variable x, for example, a Gaussian, if you want. I take sets which are decreasing. So if you if it's not Gaussian, you can take Gaussian identity in R2. Right? Uh, you, you take sets which are decreasing like that. Uh, and the objective is to compute the law of the random variable given it is in the set, in the small set. The set are sm getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so I call it eta n. So you can think of a black box. Uh, x enters and, and the output is a function of x. And uh, you want to look at the function of x which are critical. For example, uh, something with the with, uh, if Romer in France, here you have curves which are represented by se sequences of Gaussians around some curve, or autoregressive or thing like that. So these are sequences of Gaussians. Uh, in the code was resistance of offshore platforms, for example. Yes. Uh, if the energy at a given time is above some threshold, it broke and the offshore platform collapsed. So you want to find what are the inputs such that the output are critical. Uh, so the sets, for example, are, I don't know, the supremum of the energy is above uh, between zero and time t is above, let's say, uh, alpha n. And you take the energy higher and higher and higher. Uh, positive everything. And then you look at the, the input that makes the output larger than some bigger and bigger and bigger than it. Okay, so it's not so simple to simulate what are the inputs that make this critical. Okay, anyway, so that's an, an example of application. So this, uh, what I, so my objective is to sample this distribution. I call it lambda, uh, eta. So eta is the law restricted to the set up to some constant. I don't care about the constant. So how you go from the set a n minus one to the set a n, you multiply by the smaller set because the set a n minus one, which is here, if you multiply or you do the bias rule by the set, which is smaller, you get the smaller set. Okay, so how you go from the set a n minus one to the set a n, simply, making the restriction even stringent. Okay. Fine. Okay, so I know that the bias formula can be written as a, as a, the law of a Markov transition. The law in the beginning and the transition, which is if you are in the set, you stay. If you are not in the set, then you die and you are replaced by a new guy randomly chosen with this set. Okay, you do what you want, but you're, you're not there. <laughs> so now I, what I need is I need a shaker, as I said. The shaker is something that if I have points in the set AN, I have a way to move them so that the points are again with the desired set. So that's an example. <clears throat> if uh, lambda is Gaussian, <laughs> You move like that around, you start with a point in A, let's say uh, here. You do this operation. If the point is in A, then you, you, uh, you accept. And if the point you have done is not in A, you reject, you stay. So that's the metropolis is still. You propose, if you are in the set, if you are still in the set, you keep. Otherwise, you stay. Metropolis is still, with your reversible move associated to the Gaussian. And if you have this for plenty of coordinates, you can choose different coordinates, change a little bit. There are plenty of Turing parameters, of course. <clears throat> so I have the shaker. So because of the shaker, I can put here Pn. I can put Pn without changing. So I can put Pn here without changing. And I can put Pn here without changing. So if I succeed to sample this, the chain the Markov chain, which has this as evolution, that's the Markov transition of the chain. I cannot sample that. So what I do, I do mean fit simulation or simulation, approximate simulation. I cannot sample these transitions because I don't know the law. 
So the only thing I will do is to put capital N here and to put individuals at a given time N minus one, and I will create individual at time N doing the transition using the law at time N minus one and the shaker, okay? So suppose these guys are in the set a n minus one. So they are here. There are plenty of guys. So these are these guys. So for each of them, I first I do this transition and then I do the shaker. So let's look at this transition. For each guy, I check if he's oh sorry. Sorry. Oh. A N, A N, and A N. If the guy you have, the, you know the guy is in A N minus one. So if the guy is in the set A N, it's good for you because perfect simulation. This guy, this guy was perfect simulation here. If he's still in the set smaller, it's even better for you. Perfect. So if the guy is in the smaller set, you keep it. You keep it, and then you shake it. If the, if the guy is not in the desired set, smaller set, you kill it and you choose a guy according to this distribution. What is this distribution? Is the bias formula when you multiply the empirical measure by this. So you are looking at the empirical measure of the guys in that set, which have succeeded to go there. So what you do, in fact, at the end of the day, is all the guys which are in the desired set are accepted. So these guys, these guys here, have succeeded to enter in the smaller set are accepted, for sure. So you keep them. This guy is killed because he's not in the set. So you need to choose among the other ones which are in the set, one of them. So you kill this one and you duplicate one of them. So let's say this. You kill this one, you duplicate one of them. You kill this one, you duplicate one of them. Okay, that's my selection. The one inside, keep. The other one, duplicate inside. And then from each, so I've done this operation. From this operation, I do the shaker. So now each one, I do this operation. This one goes here, this one goes here. This one goes here, but reject, so it stay. This one goes here, this one goes here, this one goes here, but reject. Well, reject. Okay, and now you look which one have succeed to enter in the next step. So you shake, keep, shake, keep, shake, keep, shake and keep. So that's, is not the, the simulation of that chain, because you cannot do this, but is the mean fit simulation of that chain where you do the transition, but instead of the true law, you put the empirical law. That's all. Just plug in this, allows you to do the transition, and everything who was supposed to be done using this true law is done using the empirical law. That's all. <coughs> Mm -hmm. so that's of course, there are many ways to do this in an adaptive way. When you have the guys, you can de you decide where is the next step. So you can say, okay, and then you put the next set, smaller set, in such a way, in such a way that I have 80% of the guys already inside. Because if you decrease too much, there will be only one guy inside. So all of them will be killed and duplicate everything in one guy. So if the set here is chosen too small, it's not very good because you kill everyone and only one is accepted. And all of them join in. Okay, so there are many ways of doing this in an adaptive way, plenty of tricks. But that's the way to show you that as soon as you have a bias formula, you make appear the Markov transition, accept, reject, weighted to, to, to select the point. And then the shaker. <clears throat> of course, 
if you don't like indicator functions, you can, as I, as I you, you replace this by by U n, or you can take temperature U, uh, and this will now be this will be U n minus one. So now U n minus U n minus one, or maybe minus beta n minus beta n minus one U. Uh, you can play around. I don't care. Simply uh, a way to go from one to the next. So well, that's called SMC also. <clears throat> but it has nothing to do with, let's say, it's a particular example. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Yes. So what is written here is written for any G. So if you give me a, a genetic algorithm with selection G, fitness, GN, and Markov trans and mutation P, then for the same reason as written there, you are solving in the limit the same equation. Bias prediction, bias prediction. Here the prediction is MCMC. It's a prediction. Okay, so uh, so the Feynman, so it also worked for any G and any P. What I have written there, it was a trick. That, that was a shaker. But if it's not a shaker, you, you, it, it, it has that form. You have the law. You multiply and you integrate. You multiply, you integrate. You multiply, you integrate. So it's any G and any P. Mathematically, everything I said works for any G and any Markov transition. So because it works for any G and any Markov transition, I write that I mean I am interested in this type of nonlinear equations, bias and prediction. And we have seen it's a mixture of prediction, a weighted mixture like that, if you replace the law by the empirical law. So you see what happened if you don't put this, if you don't put the acceptance probabilities here, then all the points are automatic. Even the good ones are re resampled or bootstrap. I don't know how you people call it, but it, it, even the good ones are not accepted. They are re you can even lose them. That's very bad because you have perfect simulation. Okay, so uh, at the end of the day, if you want to solve this type of equation, multiply and predict and, and prediction like that, P is the, the probability transition of a Markov chain. In fact, you can solve this equation. You can solve it. Mathematically, you can solve it. In fact, instead of integrating, you multiply the Markov transition. Multiply, do the Markov transition. So at the end, you will have the product of the functions and the product of the transition so that you are integrating all the Markov chain. So what I'm saying is that solving this or this is equivalent. So if you don't like this equation, it's up to you. And if you prefer this one, keep this one. But sometimes this one is more convenient to look and sometimes this one is uh, more convenient to look. For example, if you have a shaker here, this one is very nice, uh, very simple to prove as I did in the, in the blackboard. Uh, while uh, this one, if I tell you that the mark of transition is a shaker, it's not so simple to see that this will be the Gibbs measure with the Desiree set. Okay, so now let's go back to the uh, Okay, okay. <laughs> So inversely, as I said, uh, when you have something like that to uh, to solve, it's the same as solving this nonlinear equation. So you can do a genetic algorithm or Monte Carlo sampler. The mutation is with P and the selection is with G. Okay? So as soon as I will give you plenty of examples and I will tell you what is X and what is J, then you see the algorithm because that's the way I, this is the way I do the mutation, and that's the way I do the selection. Okay, so if I give an example, I'm telling you that's the Markov chain, that's the potential G. Instantly, you see the genetic algorithm, fitness G, mutation P. Okay. I, I'm not obliged to repeat or make 10 articles for applications. Okay. So, of course, these equations can be solved explicitly in some situation, for example, when the state space is finite, we have seen that 
everything here relies on matrix operation. So these matrix operations uh, are known uh, in filtering as the Wunam filter. And uh, for linear Gaussian, if you start Gaussian, the bias formula with the likelihood uh, quadratic make a, another Gaussian. The prediction is linear Gaussian, another Gaussian. And as Victor said, everything is Gaussian. So you can solve this. Uh, I think someone showed me that there is a, uh, an article by 58 by uh, Swerlin that did also this linear Gaussian. I don't know. So in any case, in fact, it's the regression formula. It's uh, it's French, you know? It's Legendre in, in the 1980th century. <laughs> it's the regression. Anyway. Uh, so people call this equation in genetic algorithm when there are no crossover, the infinite population model. So the infinite population model is uh, this equation. Okay, so uh, yeah, maybe I, I don't have time to discuss all of this. Maybe I can switch. Yeah, maybe the origins. The origins are the, the earliest article I found by Alan Turing. I was English in the 50s. You can check his. Uh, uh, and there are plenty of equivalent algorithms. Uh, I will discuss on some of them, uh, like the, the Prune and Rich Rosenblut uh, by Grasberger in 55, uh, Fraser. As you can imagine, there is a mutation selection arise in many application areas. Uh, there is, I think, the most important is the reconfiguration diffusion Monte Carlo by Etherington in 84, uh, uh, the, the article by Olan, and the bootstrap filter by Gordon, uh, Salmon, and Smith in, in 83. Okay. So I, I, I did a website on genetic algorithm Monte Carlo methodology to prepare my promotions. So that what to look at this. Anyway, so I will not discuss on all of this. Of course, I did a lot of work on that, mainly with a lot of uh, uh, people, mainly in the beginning with Alice, uh, Dan, Terry, Laura Miklo, Jacob, and so on. So we, we, we analyze a lot this, uh, this type of models, sometimes with very bad exponential in time constants. Was not. We try to do something, and then we, we improve the constants. OK, so now let's go to maybe some more interesting things. So here we are. Okay. So the Feynman CAC updating what is written here. Okay, so this one is already what I, uh, the previous slide was exactly this. What is important is that you see here, I'm looking at the marginal at time n. So here, the function acts on the state at time n. So when you iterate like that, this equation, if you look at this, maybe I can, uh, can write on the no. Uh, maybe here. Yeah. I know oh, nobody, uh, remote people cannot see it, but if I take gn of x, the likelihood of uh, yn uh, given xn minus 1, so let's say. I take a potential function, which is the likelihood of yn given xn minus 1 for those interested in filtering. And then the transition at time n, which is the transition of xn given xn minus 1 and yn, badly written, of course, it should be dxn. Okay. So the transition using one observation. Then eta n is the the, the optimal filter. So the opti if you apply the, the genetic algorithm, this fitness and this Markov transition, you obtain the you obtain the optimal filter. If you don't like this one and you say, okay, I think people are calling that the, the bootstrap. So if you do that, but at time n, so sorry, at time n now, you, you take the likelihood 
the, the potential function at time n is the likelihood, instantaneous, and the transition is without the observation, then eta n will be the predictor. I insist on this because depending on the choice of the potential or the p, uh, you solve a different problem, but it's still mathematically the same algorithm. But, uh, I think it's quite important. So now when you look at the path space model, that's a little more complicated because instead of looking at the state at time n, you look at the trajectory. Uh, so in, in the, the difference between my notations here is that x will correspond to x0 to dot n. If I, no? the, the MATLAB notation in, in MATLAB notation, x is x zero to dot n, from zero to n. Okay, so here you already see that, imagine the g are indicator function. That's a Markov chain, okay, the law of the Markov chain. So this is the law of the Markov chain, given the, the, the state are in the set all the time, right? So it has an interpretation, it's the law of the chain, given it is in the set all the time. So now suppose this guy, you divide because you don't like that chain. I don't know, for some reason, you are allergic to this Markov chain. So you want to change the Markov chain. You take a linear Gaussian model, for example. So, so you replace, oops, you replace the law of the chain you had in the beginning by the, the, by the law of a Gaussian, linear Gaussian. But in doing so, you, you you replace the G by, by the change of probabilities, by the weights. Okay? So you have new weights and you have a new P. So you can change P, but you will need to change the G. You can, cha you can change the G, but you will need to change the P for the same object. So as soon as you have decided what is G and what is P, you have the algorithm. But depending on the choice of G and P, the algorithm is different. <laughs> See? So it's complete, it's a Turing parameter. So mathematically, I can write a lot of abstract things, but it leaves open the way to tune this parameter, how to choose G, how to choose P. <coughs> if you look at the variance asymptotically, uh, it's more or less the same. But in a non-asymptotic way, I think nobody has really understood what who was doing it. It's a non-asymptotic way. Because as I said, uh, if you have this problem, you can take this. Some people claim this is optimal, but it's the same model, mathematically. What? Okay. So of course, uh, you can do a lot of things. Say the, the when I do the Markov chain, the law of the point is not the true law. So you can say in the average, it's almost a good one. So of course, if, if you work with an industry, people and say, okay, in the average, it's okay should be fine. The guy said, yeah, well, in the average, it's okay, but I want a little more. So uh, the variance is fine. The CLT is uh, perfect variance. And I will show you that some example with the variance is uniformly bounded in time, and the non-asymptotic one is explode in time. So it's not convenient. So I think it's more, uh, and, and there is a lot of room for that, to look at the probability of error. Someone in operation research told me that everything we were doing are meta heuristic. So I say, no, it's the law of large number. The ergodic theorem, these guys are not meta heuristic. He say, yes, because it's still random. So when you do the algorithm, at some point, the probability to make a small error is small, but still random. It's a heuristic. Okay, so it's complicated to discuss with. Uh, collaborators in operational research. So, of course, it's a heuristic. Everything is random, it's a heuristic. But you can try to calibrate the probability of making an error. In fact, as soon as you have this type of estimates, these are uniform in time. This implies LP bound uniform in time. The reverse is not true. From the LP bound uniform in time, you don't have this, except if you have nice constant depending on the moment. But this is more powerful than any type of result. 
but the only result we have obtained, uh, I, I put some references here, but it was only based on bad compact mineralization condition, which basically works for diffusion model uh, reflected uh, on the boundary of the galaxy. So of course the constant may not be nice, but every diffusion on a compact set, if it's reflected, uh, satisfy the minorization condition. So it's not so bad. Try to, to sell what we did. Okay, so this is exactly what I did. If you're not interested into the problem, uh, the problem with um, with bias and then prediction, and you want to look only after the bias updating. So if you want to do that, you say, I'm not interested into the predictor, I want the filter, okay? It means that inside you have a product up to N, not N excluded, but N included. If you do that, you can rewrite things and everything rewrite in the same way, but the new potential is the, 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 the mean value of the likelihood at time N, which corresponds to this one. And uh, the, the mutation transition, which corresponds to the prediction multiplied by the likelihood, which corresponds to this one, it's the same. And of course, sometimes you cannot uh, sum or compute explicitly these uh, quantities. So one strategy we did some years ago is to say, if I am I'm at X n minus one and I want to sample that, I sample plenty of particles around like that plenty of transition, possible transitions, and I replace the transition by the empirical transition. And then you have a weighted transitions and you can approximately do the job uh, without introducing bias. So if you are interested, I, I put some example, you look at this, it's a quite old article and uh, you will see the, or you can compute this in some ex examples. And if you cannot compute, there are some tricks to approximate without introducing the bias. Okay, so now the semi-group uh, is to say that uh, maybe I, I will not have time to discuss on this. I will go, go uh, and jump a little more, more application. I will come back if needed. Okay, so I think people are more interested into that. <laughs> the variety of interpretation, <laughs> there are plenty. The models are very abstract. As I said, I can take a potential G, a Markov transition P. Let's see some examples. Uh, okay, so depending on how you choose G and how you choose P, you have different interpretation and different targets. Of course, as you can imagine, these are more or less the one I will use today uh, during the, the, the lecture, but also to tell you that it contains continuous time models because if you take a continuous time model trajectory from one time to another, that's still Markov. And you can put a weight on the trajectory taking exponential of integrals as soon as you can sample the continuous time model and you can compute the integral, you can deal with continuous time model. There are a lot of work nowadays for people in branching processes that realize that the first moment of a branching process is um, uh, is a feynman kag model in continuous time. And then you can write the continuous time particle sampler. But if you write the continuous time particle model, which corresponds to the part continuous time particle filter or continuous time sequential Monte Carlo and so on, you still need to simulate the, the process in continuous time. So, it's not a, so you can do a lot of math, but still there is an approximation. It, it, but if you can do in discrete time, you can embed continuous time model into discrete time without making error. In, in fact, you don't you don't do more error than they do. <laughs> because if you discretize the time, you enter into discrete time model. How the discrete time model approximate the continuous time model? That's another question. But if you have a continuous time model and you do the continuous time algorithm, it doesn't work because in practice you need to discretize. Okay, anyway, uh, you can work in these excursion spaces. You can work, uh, and as I said, <clears throat> you can change the P and the G. 
So there are plenty of choices. Okay, so let's see. So that's a very, um, so this is where people call quasi-invariant measure. So the, that's the place where things arrive. So you, you, take, a, uh, you take a Markov transition. So I'm not talking about filtering. Eh? Y has nothing to do with the observation. It's a, it's a Y variable. So that's a Markov transition. And that's a function between zero and one. So in fact, when you multiply the Markov transition by some function, which is between zero and one, you obtain some positive integral operator. It means that it's positive, of course. And if you integrate the y's, this becomes one, you obtain this. So if you integrate one, it's no more equal to one, it's equal to this, okay? So you have lost, you have lost some mass somewhere. Because typically, if you have a Markov transition and you integrate the function one, you get one, no? So the Markov transition, if you integrate, is the, the expected value of one is one. So the, the, the mean value of the of one given x is one. Yeah, we agree with everything on that. Yeah? So if you integrate now the y's, because of this multiplication, is no more one. So some mass has been lost. So in probability, at least when we you lose mass, you 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 take a symmetry and you put all the, the mass which is lost in this place. <clears throat> so that's the trick. So you take the state space and, and you stay and you add a symmetry point. Okay. And and you do okay. So now if you are in the symmetry, because now the state space has, has been extended. So if I add a symmetry point, I need to explain to the process what he's supposed to do if he enters in the symmetry state. So if he enter in the symmetry state, there is no problem here. He stay in the symmetry, okay? No more zombie style stuff. Symmetry, he stay in the symmetry, doesn't move. And uh, the function on the space are kept the same, but on the symmetry, we put zero make it simple. So now you take the, the new Markov chain. It's not the Markov chain we had here. It's another Markov chain. And you said it evolves in this space. So there is an absorption probability. So one minus G is the chance to be absorbed. So you look at the, the, the guy, you look at the, the, the likelihood or the fitness of this system location and with this probability uh, is kept otherwise it dies so absorption means i put the guy in the symmetry with this probability i don't know if it's written more i'm sorry for my english <laughs> you take the, the the function g you evaluate uh, the function g at that point and one minus G is the chance to kill the guy. Repeat, you are somewhere, you evaluate your fitness. With this probability, you don't do anything. Otherwise, you are killed. It's understandable. <laughs> okay. And if you are not killed, if you are not killed, you explore the space as that chain was doing. Okay, so that's the way, the trick to create a Markov chain from something which is not a Markov chain transition. So this is not a Markov chain transition because if you integrate one, you have not one. And so that's the way to create a Markov chain. Okay, so now if you look at the law of the Markov chain, even it is not has not been absorbed, and this coincide with the, the, the feynman kag measure on pass space. So you need to keep in mind my notation. Sorry for that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Q. Uh, Q is the law on pass space. So uh, the, 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 
the x from 0 n multiplied by the product of the, the, the function g. Okay? So maybe I can give an example on the, on the, on the other blackboard. Import on that. Okay, so let's take this example, indicator X and the law of a Markov chain. For example, a simple random walk. And you start at zero. That's the time. That's the set A. Okay. So the, the random walk is like that. You are somewhere. So let's say you start at zero. So let, let's start at zero. So you look at the indicator function. Okay. Look here. Yeah. So you look at this. You check if you are killed or not in the beginning. So you compute G of the point at time zero. So it means that you check, you check if you start in the set. If you are in the set, the, the function g is equal to one, so you are not killed. Okay. And then you move as a simple random walk. Then you check if the next is in the set, you are not killed. You move, you move. And suddenly, poof, at a given time, uh, at a given time t uh, is zero, it go outside at that time, it go outside and it's killed. So at that time, it takes the value c. Okay, so at that time, you kill the point, you put it in uh, the place. So if you look at what is the law of the chain given it's not killed, but in fact, is the law, if it's not killed at time n, it means that at time zero, it is in the set. At time a, it is in the set. It's always in the set. Uh, at time n minus one. And, uh, and, and then you it, it follows, it starts somewhere and it follow the transitions you want. So that's the interpretation of this law, the law of the trajectory given it's not absorbed is the law of the trajectory given it's not absorbed here, not absorbed here, not absorbed here, so it's the product. So it means it's this times the product of the function from zero to n minus one. Each function is the indicator function. So it's exactly the feynman kag model. I wrote previously, so you check if the point is in the set or not. And so that's why people call that uh, the quasi-invariant measure. Uh, so that's exactly what I wrote. Uh, sorry. Is, if you look at the terminal point where the guy is hiding, given the fact it has not been absorbed, that's an important point. Uh, and in fact, if you look for long runs, the Markov chain, the guy, how the guy is distributed, is distributed according to something like that. So what is the law of the point given it has not been absorbed? Uh, this eta infinity is given by something like that. It's close to zero because the, it doesn't like the boundaries and inside it's okay. And in fact, for this example, uh, this is connected to a sinus. You can explicitly compute this stuff. So the chance to stay inside the set without being absorbed 
it's becoming extremely small. And in fact, it's a normalizing constant. The normalizing constant of this feynman kerr model is the chance for not being absorbed. So the chance to say in the set all the time. So what is the algorithm to do that? Well, you sample plenty of particles. If they are in the set, potential one, accept, 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 accept. But one day, one particle flow out. So this particle is killed and instantly another one duplicate. These one are in, in the middle, they are accepted all the time. When one is killed, it jumps to a new location, randomly chosen among the other one, multiplied by the indicator function, so that the one that are inside. So the corresponding sequential Monte Carlo or diffusion Monte Carlo, as you want to call it, is as soon as one go outside, instantly another one duplicate. And so on and so on. So now you can say, okay, but I don't like this. I don't like this process. So I want to know the process, which is the process given the fact that in the boundary is reflected. So what does it mean? It means that when you are when you are here, let's say, you have two chances to go up or down. So it's okay, you keep it. But when you are here, you have one chance to go out, one chance to go down. If I want to eliminate this guy, I'm looking at the transition given it is accepted. So I'm looking at the transition to go from X to Y, but I want the Y to be accepted. It's exactly the P times the potential function and so on. So that corresponds to the P, uh, to, to this one. When you look at the transition and you multiply by the likelihood, you obtain this. When you take the transition and you multiply by the likelihood, you are making a, 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 a one-step conditioning. Okay, so what is this? Which I call it P hat. It, it means that if you are in X, you cannot go elsewhere than in A. So you're obliged to stay in five. Okay? So this guy, if it's uh, in the set, is obliged to go down here. You cannot do that. Okay? But if I do that, so now I, I replace all the guys by these guys. So they are reflected. Each time they go here, they, they have not the possibility to go out. Impossible for them because of this. If I've done that, it was not these guys I had. I had the I had these guys. I don't have this. So now the functions here are, are coming everywhere. So you are, you have to reweight things. In the beginning, you have the product of this. Now you make a pair of this, but, but if you make a pair of this, you need to multiply by this to recover the initial distribution. So what is this? This is the chance if you are in X to stay in A. So if you are here, the chance to stay in A is not here. If you are here, the chance to stay in A is one. But if you are here, the chance to stay in A is one half. So it means that the algorithm of particles, they explore the space. In the first algorithm, when they go out they are killed instantly, another one duplicate. In the other algorithm, they are reflected, but still they have a function G arriving, which which by its value is one half. So you have to kill the particle with probability one half. So there is a new weight coming in. So now, because of the change of probability, you decide not to, you decide to be reflected, but the price to pay is a, a, a potential function or a fitness function, as you want, which value is one half here and one here. So here always accepted, but here it can be killed with probability one half. 
the algorithms are totally different. Okay. <coughs> it's funny because uh, we did a, a paper with AJ on this, and uh, because you can do Im important sampling, as he perceived the algorithms, we he start asking us this question. And in fact, the, when you do local conditioning, it's not global conditioning. The law of a chain, given its stay for long run in a tube, is not the same as the law of the reflected chain. When locally you are reflected, it's not the way to sample the chain given its stay in the tube. That's not true. The law of a Markov chain, given its stay in the tube, is not the law of the chain where locally you force reflection. So you need to put some weights which are one half. So as soon as the guy is moving too much around the boundaries, the weights are one half, one half, one half, one half, one half. So if you don't reach sample or bootstrap or select, then you have products of one half too many times. So the important sampling explodes. You have to, to, to reach sample, to reject the points. Okay, anyway, so that's another example, which I like this one. Uh, so this one is, uh, it's coming from the Rosenblum stuff I discussed in the beginning. So let, let's suppose you have a simple, um, a random walk on the, on the, on the two-dimensional lattice. So you have a random walk that goes up or down. The random walk go uh, as four possibility, left, right, up or down, start at zero. So you, what you look is the Markov chain, which is the history of the of the, the random walk. And we know that the history of the simple random walk is again a Markov chain. <laughs> the history is always a Markov chain. How you go from this history to the next, you keep the history and simply add the new state. Now I'm taking the, the potential function. I'm checking if the last point has not been seen. So I'm looking at if the last point of the trajectory is not touching one point I've seen in the past. The last point is not, has not been seen in the past. Okay. So when you multiply the law of the simple random walk by this product of functions, you are putting more pressure. You are looking at the random walk given the first step doesn't touch the past, the second step doesn't touch the past, the, se the third doesn't touch. So you are looking at the, the, the simple random walk given no intersection with the past. So how to sample a simple random walk given there are no intersection with the past? So it's complicated because the random walk, at least in two dimensions, uh, tends to go back to zero. So you go way up, back to zero. We, we touch the past. But it's very tempted to touch the past. In dimension three, it has the ability to go outside. But most of the time, in one or two dimension, they come back to, uh, it's recurrent. They, they come back and they touch the past. So sampling a uh, random work, given there are no intersection in the past, uh, th there are many ways. One thing to do is to sample. And if there is an intersection, what you do, you reject, and you start again. Start, touch, go, you restart, you can do that. So there is a kind of competition to sample the, the longest simple random walk that doesn't touch in the past. So you do the genetic algorithm the same. You sample the plenty of random walks. Each time one touch the past, it's killed. And instantly, another one, which have not touched the past, duplicate. And then each one moving a bit until one of them touched the past is eliminate and another one duplicate. You see the imagination? Not similar to this reflection idea? Uh, uh, no, 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 that's bit. another stuff. But no, no, okay, okay, I, I will explain. So the, the random work here, it's one or zero. So instead of having one, it's always one or zero. If you touch, you kill, you reject. But when you reject, because you have plenty of guys which have been doing well, you duplicate one of them. And then from this one, you do the mutation. So it means that 
you extend each one a little bit. But still, if it touch the past, the, 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 the function is killed. Yeah? So that's one way to do that. Uh, another way is to say, okay, now I, I will force the random walk not to touch the past. So if it's here, uh, he has four possibilities because there is nothing around. But if it's here and he see one point in the past and he has three possibilities to go back, he will choose only the other ones. You need to reduce the weight as you did in yes. the other time, yes. three fourths or something. Yes, exactly. So then it corresponds. So okay. you force locally not to do bad, okay. but you need to put a weight. Same problem after some time. Same uh, problem. So that's a, in molecular chemistry is a big problem to to sample of this is. And instead of this, this is quite uh, crude, because zero or one, mm -hmm. you can put penalties, explanation minus uh, how many times you have touched in the past. You put, that's called the Edwards model and things like that, to put more and more pressure if you touch too much in the past. Plenty of models. Like that. So that's, uh, of course, if you do that, you obtain the law of the simple random walk given there is no intersection in the past. Uh, and if you look at the normalizing constant, is the chance for the random walk not to touch guys in the past. So that's very, uh, if, you, if you look at the random walk, each time you have one, you have 2D possibilities. So every trajectory have the same probability. Okay. But you only count the simple random walk, self-avoiding walks. So all the self-avoiding walks, that's the only one you count, have the same probability, the trajectory. So in fact, computing the normalizing constant is the same as computing the number of self-avoiding walks of a given length. And that's, uh, it's connected to the connective constant. You can ask to Vandeline Werner, who had the film medals on that, not computing that, but doing some loop erasing uh, Brownian motion and things like that, to do this in an analytical way, not doing Monte Carlo simulation. So it's easier with the Monte Carlo. <laughs> anyway, so that's the one I'm talking about, the Edward model. So this was the Rosenblut, Rosenblut pruning algorithm. Okay, so now uh, there is another one which is called the excursion. So now suppose you have, so here I need, I need, so this one is connected to rare events. No. Okay. So I'm considering uh, two sets. Uh, let's do it in that way. I have a, a random walk that go up and down with probability, let's say, uh, uh, one tenth or nine tenth. I have a random walk that go up and down. It's very tempted to go down. So I choose a set, which is uh, B. B is the set from here backward. That's it. And, and the set uh, A are increasing, more and more increasing like that. So this is A1, A2. They are decreasing the set. So I'm considering a uh, TN. TN is the first time after some after some time with it. So let's say you start uh, somewhere here. Yeah. T0, and you look at the first time the process touch the set A N or B. So for example, here you, you look at T1, T0, let's say is zero. You look at the first time you touch this or this. You have two possibilities, or you are here, or you are here, one or the other. Uh, yes, 
So now I'm looking at the excursion between these sets. Here, the excursion between this time. So this, for example, at T0, the excursion to T1 will be or this or this. So two possibilities. I have a Markov chain. I start here. Uh, the, the, the value is this or the excursion up to here. So I have two possible excursions. Uh, okay, and now I look at the function G, which is does the, the excursion and what I where I want. So I'm checking if I have succeeded to go there, the potential value is one, and if I'm here, the potential value is zero. Okay. It's, quite, it's a mark of process. Okay. Uh, so you can see, so, uh, sorry. You can see that touch this set or this set. So the first one is doing this or this, but if it's here, it's stuck here, okay? Because uh, suppose the excursion here is this one, okay? So now if you look T2, T2 is the first time you touch this or this, but you are already here, so you stay there. So as soon as one has touched the set B, it stay all the time on the set B. And the, the, the function G is only there to check if you have succeeded to pass the level, okay? So this is my Markov process, and this is my function. Uh, so what, what happened to this is that the, if you multiply the law of the process by this, you are saying that the process touch this, then it touch this, then it touch this, then it touch this before to go there. Okay, so if you multiply the function G, which are here, you, this is my Markov process. You multiply by the function G, so you are asking the process to touch the set A1, that touch the set A2, touch the set A3, before to go back to zero. So the, what you are sampling is the law of n excursion given you have succeeded to hit the set above before to do that. So that's uh, quite simple to see this is correct, of course, because you, you multiply these functions. So you ask this to be here, next to be here, that's quite simple. So now let's see what is the algorithm. You sample plenty of uh, particles, plenty. Some of them go here, some of them go there. These guys are killed, 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 and this one duplicate. It's the trajectory that duplicates. Okay. Then that's from here. Some of them succeed, some of them go down. Some of them succeed, some of them go down. The one which are here killed, and the one that succeeds to go there are duplicated. So you sample the Markov chain, plenty of excursions. The one that go down, you are killed, and the other one that go up, duplicated. So at the end of the day, yes. You only duplicate it once it like hits a set, or just any time between set. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I, I need, for example, in the beginning, I need to wait everything, something happened. For example, in the beginning, I need to wait these guys go up to here and the guy that go here. So now these guys are eliminated. And uh, what I do is these guys have succeed so that these three guys have been eliminated. So I, I duplicate this, for example, and I duplicate these ones. Maybe I have three here, two and one. And now I sample the next state. The next state is I, I, I do the simulation until it touch here or until it goes here. So, I mean, because the state is the excursion. So I need to wait it touch, the, if he succeed to go here or he go there. So if the guy is doing this, <coughs> I need to wait. I need to wait until he decide uh, to do this, 
or until he decides to go down. Uh, typically, it's a rare event, so he has, he, the, the set B is very attractive. So, and as soon as everyone has finished, succeed to pass or, or kill, I, I, I do the same. I kill the bad one and duplicate the other ones. So all of them have to hit an event before we can compute anything? Yeah, okay. I need to wait. So sometimes it's complicated. Of course, the set, you, you put the sets in small levels like that, but you need to wait. So they pass quite easily because they have only one ten chance to go up. So very few will succeed to go up. Most of them will go down. So you need to take care where you put the sets. So that's a tuning parameter. It can be done adaptively and so on. There is a lot of adaptive things. Okay, so filtering, everyone knows the filtering. Uh, so maybe I will not discuss on that. Okay, so you, you, the filtering problem is a Markov chain. The signal is given by some Markov transition. And as soon as you have the state of the signal, you create an observation with some likelihood function. And of course, if you take the likelihood function, uh, you obtain the predictor. And if you work in past space, you obtain the, the trajectory of the, the signal given the observations. If you work with the updated measure, is the, uh, the, the optimal filter, and so on and so on. Okay, so uh, let's discuss on untractable likelihood. Yeah, in some situation, you cannot uh, compute the likelihood of the observation given the state. Uh, this happens sometimes when you do counting, when the observation come from some counting, uh, Poisson counting. So the likelihood is, is an infinite sum. So it's uh, complicated to, uh, to compute. So in some situation, you cannot do the computation of the likelihood uh, functions. So uh, something we did with Jean Jacob and Proter some years uh, time ago is to say, let's say that the signal is the pair. The signal is X and the observation. And I create a virtual observation, which is, let's say, the true plus epsilon noise. Of course, I have transformed the problem, the filtering problem, into another one. Because you say that, that was not the case, of course. But when epsilon is close to zero, the law of the first coordinate given the second is taken at the value of the, the observation. When epsilon is close to zero, it's the same. Close, they are close. That's for if you don't like this uh, formulation, but it's the same. It's called ABC in stats. Okay, you consider the pair, and you create a virtual observation which can be sufficient statistics or whatever you want, and and in fact you sample the pairs and you check if the corresponding observation is close to what you had. So because here the likelihood of the observation given the second coordinate can be computed, this Gaussian, for example. So in that case, you can compute the likelihood functions. Uh, OK, so that's uh, something we did. OK. Uh, Kalman filter. How, how, how many times? I think I, until past 15. Around 25 minutes. 25 minutes, OK. So I will do this. So the Kalman filter, I will do this for those who want to understand the ensemble Kalman filter. Because uh, up to now, I have discussed on genetic type algorithms. And this, I will discuss on the ensemble Kalman filter. There will be some talks next week. But I will show you a nice trick to, uh, to, to derive these, these models. So the Kalman filter is, is the case where the x is linear Gaussian. The function g is related to the observation. Uh, in the following way, Cx is linear here. Uh, let me add that if you take uh, the observation equal to zero, the bias formula applies, everything applies. And uh, in that Gaussian world, as soon as you have a quadratic and linear dependency here, when you start from a Gaussian and you apply the bias formula, you obtain another Gaussian. That's known for ages. But what is important, I, I insist on that, is that even if you take observation equal to zero, uh, it works. 
An observation equal to zero corresponds to what people in physics are, do, are called the harmonic oscillator. So that's why if sometimes you have difficulties in handling things because the fitness function, the likelihood functions are random, think that you can take observation equal to zero and your model is also used in physics. It's called the harmonic oscillator. And people try to compute eigenvalues, limiting uh, eta infinity and things like that. So it, it, there is, and they apply the same genetic algorithms. So if you want to work on easier model, enter into the physics world because you can take observation equal to zero. And believe me, things get simplified a lot because everything becomes homogeneous in time. The, the G doesn't depend on the observation. It doesn't depend on time. If you take a linear Gaussian model, it's done. So say it's, it's simpler. But anyway, so if you start with a Gaussian with a mean and a variance, when you apply the bias formula, you obtain another Gaussian with the mean and the variance, which are computed using the well-known uh, Kalman uh, recursion, updating recursion. What is important is to see that the gain here is computed in terms of the variance of the previous law. That's important. Okay? The gain is computed in terms of the variance of the previous law. Yeah. So that. Uh, so the prediction is the same. When you integrate the Gaussian by the prediction, you obtain another Gaussian. And as Victor showed this morning, of course, you increase the noise. The noise is increased. And the prediction is this term. I'm not doing the backward term, but the prediction is uh, the predicted value of the mean is given by eight times the, the updated mean. OK. So uh, OK, so this is done. So that's a summary. If you start Gaussian, everything is Gaussian. Uh, okay, so that's another way of writing. And that's the way why, uh, how people introduce the ensemble Kalman. So up to now, we have just said that if I start with a Gaussian mean variance, I get another Gaussian mean variance. I want to do a stochastic version. I want to define the random variable who has this mean and this variance. Okay? It's not the same as saying the mean and the variance of the next is computed by Kalman recursion. I don't want to do that. So that's the trick. If you start with a given mean, so See, this, this random variable is Gaussian. It has a mean and a variance. Now I introduce a noise, which is the same style noise of the observation. I plug this observation noise here. There is a parenthesis missing here. And I do this, I, I define this random variable in the following way. I keep this, this, but I have an, I had an extra noise. I, uh, I have the right to do it at least. So I do it. And I define a random variable in the following way. Uh, I claim that this random variable has the desired mean and the desired variance given by the Kalman recursion. It's different, you see? I have just introduced a noise here. Okay. So I, I, I made the proof. I will not make the proof. Believe me, it's true. <laughs> Otherwise, a lot of articles are collapsing. <laughs> so this is a, another way of writing. For the mean, it's quite simple. For the mean, it's very simple. Because this is a Gaussian centered. So if you take the mean of this, is the mean of this, the mean of this, and you recover, oops, oops, and you recover, uh, you recover this expression, the mean and the mean, and you kill the other guy. For the mean, it's simple. It's the variance, which is a bit tricky. So you see, when you're uh, checking that the mean of this random variable is the good one, very simple. What is more tricky is to check that the variance of this is the updated variance. That's the, the only point. 
Okay, so now for this one, it's very simple. If this guy has the desired mean and desired variance, if you add noise, you create a random variable with the desired mean and desired variance. So that's trivial. So at the end of the day, I obtain this equation. You start from uh, from where? Yeah, you start from here. You you do this operation, creating some noise. And when you have corrected the point like that in a stochastic way, adding some extra noise, you plug it here and you add another extra noise. I have the right to do it. <laughs> if I do that, this is a Markov chain. But from here, I go there, sampling the noise. And from there, I go there, sampling the noise. And so, so this is a Markov chain. And the Markov chain depends on Rn. And Rn is the conditional variance of the state you had before. So we have exactly in the setting we discussed last time. I have a Markov chain, but unfortunately, sorry, Unfortunately, this guy is connected to the law of that guy. So if if I don't know the law of that guy, I will have difficulties to know this parameter. In fact, here I know because everything is linear Gaussian. But, but you make as if you didn't knew that. Okay? So you have a Markov chain. Uh -huh. A Markov chain that depends on the law you had before. So, because you don't like the, we don't like, I think. Nobody likes, in fact, <laughs> uh, to compute the Riccati equation. So, the evolution of the variances are given by Riccati equation, even the gain and so on. Of course, I did the one dimension, but the multiple dimension is more complex, of course. So you don't want to compute the evolution of the variance or the covariance matrices. So what I did is to avoid discussing at the evolution of the variances. The only thing I did is to say, okay, I first <laughs> want to write a Markov chain that depends on the variance of the state before. And if you want to do calculation for the variances of that chain, you do that, you do the calculation. But the Markov chain is well defined independently of the Riccati equation. Okay, I, I can write the Markov chain and tell you that this is the variance of the state before given the observations. Okay, so the chain is well defined even if I don't give you the evolution of the variance. That's important. So when you see this and you don't see the evolution of the variance, variances, you say, okay, well, how I can sample that chain? I can sample the noise, I can sample the noise, but without the evolution of these guys, I cannot do these calculations. Well, you do uh, mean field simulation, particle simulation. So you sample the noises, you sample from one state to the next, one state to the next, one, uh, that's nice. And instead of plugging here the variance, you take the, the sample variance and that's it. And you have completely forgotten the evolution of the variances because you have replaced the variances by the sample variances. <clears throat> so you can tell me, yeah, but everything you did here why you have introduced all of these crazy noises? If you don't introduce these crazy noises, the, va the, the sample variance will be not well defined because there will be not randomness. So all the points will be in the same place except the randomness from the start. Imagine they start from the same location. In fact, all the points will have the same uh, value. And then the, the sample variance will be not well defined. So it's important to rewrite things in terms of nonlinear Markov chain with the variance of the state before. And when you need the variance of the state, you sample plenty of particles and replace the, the variance by the sample variance. That's it. 
So you can say yes, but uh, people in ensemble Kalman uh, stuff, uh, they don't do linear Gaussian models. Yes. Question, you just said um, sample plenty of states, right? Yeah. But in practice, what they like to do is to take a very small number of ensemble models. Why does it still work? Okay. So, uh, in fact, this is in one dimension. So, in one dimension, everything works, basically. If you have 10 particles, it's okay. But it, indeed, in practice, uh, they are, what they do is the dimension is massive. Sometimes it's in, I don't know, 10 power 6 million, something like that. And uh, and they only sample 10 or 20 particles. And so there is a problem when they compute the sample uh, covariance. <clears throat> because the sample covariance is the sum of rank 1 matrices. And the sum of rank 1 matrices, if you have only 20 uh, matrices of rank 1, uh, you cannot... Uh, uh, have uh, more than uh, 20 uh, rank, <laughs> rank dimension. So you have, it's sparse, totally sparse. So there are some directions which are not controlled. And these uncontrolled directions, uh, to, to stabilize this effective style dimension, they add inflation. So they add epsilon identity or thing like that. So they artificially increase it. Yes. Yeah, because what's important is that you see the a here. If a is a, so you can multiply uh, a, a, uh, and you will see that in fact you will have the. Um, this guy is here to stabilize the a. If if a is unstable, the filter track the unstable. And what what is important is this plays the role of a controller. So the controller will uh, stabilize uh, the A. One dimension is fine, but if he has too much dimension, it doesn't know, it doesn't know which one is unstable. So if the rank if the rank of the matrices is, is sparse, uh, you don't have enough rank one matrices to sum up, and you lose the uh, this unstable dimension, you cannot uh, track them. Imagine that uh, this matrix has the first diagonal uh, is uh, uh, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, then stable. So the very first dimension are, are highly unstable. If the rank one matrix, when, when you look at the covariance matrix, it has zero in the upper block, uh, this unstable dimension, nobody will stabilize them. And then uh, your filter collapses. So it's better to add alpha identity. That's what people call inflation. And the more you have particles, the less you need to inflate. Uh, there are also other things to do Adamar product because uh, out, outside the diagonal, there are some uh, crazy random numbers appearing because you don't have enough uh, precision. So you need to clean everything outside some band in the diagonal to put zero here. So you put some mask Adamar product, entry by entry product to kill everything which is too far from the diagonal. So there are plenty of tricks. And the more important is that if the model is non-linear, you put parentheses. <laughs> and then you don't know what's going on. Now that's another question. Anyway. Uh, okay. So now let's look, and I think uh five ten minutes more okay so, uh, it's much but it's it's better to say less but better than uh, so now let's look at particle filters how particle filters uh, can, uh, apply to this situation so uh i'm talking about the genetic algorithm smc dmc and uh, what people call the bootstrap particle filter, which has never been introduced in the literature. I know the particle filter, I know the bootstrap filter, but the merging, I don't know that. Maybe if they... Okay, so let's look at this, the selection. Let's look the bootstrap particle filter. So the selection is quite simple. You, you take the likelihood of the observation given the position. I'm talking about linear Gaussian model. For the linear Gaussian model, the selection or the resampling or the bootstrap, I don't know how to capture your attention, 
is uh, sampling according to this weighted measure, right? Then uh, from these selected points, you sample noise to get the next prediction, right? Okay. And uh, typically, every everyone has done that. You take the sample mean, and you say that's quite close to the Kalman filter. Everyone has done that, one day or another. Okay, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a nice paper, because everything which has been proved in for particle filter doesn't apply uniform in time to uh, the linear Gaussian model. There is no result. The only result I know is the paper by uh, Nick Whiteley, published in 2013. He put some condition and he showed that the, the central limit variance of the particle filter for any drift is stable, independent, is uniformly under control in time. Nice. Central limit variance, everything works. So then I moved to uh, Bristol some years ago, and we start discussing on that with Christophe and Mathieu. And we found this trick that says that if the A is unstable, so this is a theorem, let's say, if the A is unstable and you start all the particles above this quantity, so log, log of the number of sample is not so much. In fact, you even take a square root, so it's not so far away. Okay, if you take all the particles above, that, then the sample mean of the particle filter against the Kalman mean in L1, so for any LP, in fact, uh, explode. So it's quite simple to see what's going on because if A, imagine A is 1 million. And imagine that the signal has a chance to go down forever. If you start at negative, you 1 million negative, plus or minus one, let's say the little noise. And then times 1 million negative, you go down, down, down like crazy. Okay. So you go to zero exponentially fast to minus infinity. But if you start all the particle uh, positive, a bit too much, then when you multiply by A, they will go up like crazy. <laughs> they, they jump up, 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 and you say, okay, you made a mistake because the observation is down. Guys. So you say, all of them go one million times too high, and then they do little moves, and you say, among these little moves, let's choose the best, okay, <laughs> this one. And then you put all of them here, and then you multiply by one million again higher and higher and higher. They they cannot, even if they know that the observation is down, they cannot do anything. So you have explosion of the particle filter if A is unstable. It's quite simple to prove, but still it is a, it's, a, it's an explosion. But the the advantage is that. Oh, this is some, uh, something we we did with Adrian and I don't remember. Anyway, it's for the ensemble Kalman. The ensemble Kalman track in dimension one, even if you are one million times, doesn't care. It tracks. So the ensemble Kalman doesn't have explosion. He can track the Kalman filter uniformly in time, while the the, the particle filter explode in time if wrong initialized in dimension one. So you can say, yeah, maybe multi-dimension, if I do this and do this, maybe, I don't know. Because the, the, the proof for the linear Gaussian model, for the Kalman filter, uh, has, has been done only numerically. So if someone has some references uh, for the linear Gaussian model, even for stable, uh, I will be happy to 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 look at them. Okay, now I stop. Strange. <laughs> uh, I know there's two different types of.